Hey everyone, welcome to this video walkthrough for the Udacity Pick and Place project. As you can see in front of you, we're going to cover a variety of things here today. If you need to access a specific section, please use the hyperlinks below this video. If you haven't attempted the project, I encourage you to do so and only move to one of these sections when you find yourself stuck. Alright, let's get started. For this video, I'll be assuming that you're using VMware as well as version 2.1 of the Udacity Virtual Machine. Before we get started, I want to touch on a few things. First thing is resource allocation. Now these settings are going to look different for Windows and Linux, but the process will be the same. By default, the virtual machine comes set at two processor cores and four gigabytes of memory. Here, I'll be running four processor cores and eight gigabytes of memory. The more you can allocate, the better performance you're going to get from your virtual machine. Furthermore, be sure to make sure that you have at least the recommended amount of shared graphics memory. And again, the more you allocate, the better performance you'll get. All right, let's move on. First thing I want to note is in this version of the virtual machine, when you open up a terminal, you're going to be prompted to choose to source ROS or not. This is for new updates that allow you to use Conda and ROS in the same virtual machine. So for these examples, we will be sourcing ROS each time. Now before we get into the project, there's one thing I want to share. Uh, as a way to troubleshoot your virtual machine and your system's overall performance. There's something you can do called GLX Gears. And what this does is it runs uh, graphically simulated gears and helps gauge your overall system performance. So when you're trying to troubleshoot with your fellow classmates or through live help, this is a good way to give them the baseline of what you're working with so we can know whether or not to address your computer's virtual machine interactions. Uh, whether to programming problems. Okay, next let's go ahead and take a look at the GitHub for the project. And we are going to start by getting this project set up on the virtual machine. So the first thing we have to do is create an active ROS workspace. All right, we'll go ahead and we'll do this. Let's open up a terminal window and we will source ROS. I'm going to make a directory and you want to make the source folder as well. We're going to move into that, and we're going to call the initialization, and then we're going to move up a level, and we're going to make this with the cat can make command. Now that we have an active ROS workspace, let's move back into the source folder, and we're going to copy the Udacity kinematics project in here. All right, clone that in. Now, as you can see here, you will have to give permissions to these various files in order to execute them. The next thing we're going to take a look at is modifying the bash profile and how that works on this new virtual machine. Let's go ahead and open this window up, go back to the top level, and we'll be using nano to look at the bash profile here. Okay, and we're going to go all the way to the bottom. So with this new interactive prompt, when it asks you to source ROS, you're giving it an input choice. And when you say yes, these are the corresponding actions that happen. Whereas when you choose no, you are setting up Conda. Some things to note here is we have our sourcing of ROS. We're setting the default editor for ROS to Nano. We're adding some additional things for Project 4. Some things we can add now is we can go ahead and uncomment the source to develop setup.bash. And we can go ahead and add the export model path for the robotics kinematic project. And again, you can see that these are the two statements that you were asked to add here. Now we're just adding it to this interactive source. So let's go ahead and quit out and write the changes. All right. Now we could source that new bash. I prefer just to open up a new terminal window to make those changes. Let's go ahead and take a look at the script that you're going to be filling out for this project and what is expected of you. So you will be responsible for filling out the IK server code and running that for this project in order to successfully grab the cylinders off the shelf and deposit them in the bin. This is going to work by defining your DH parameter symbols, uh, some symbolic joint symbols, filling out your DH parameter table, creating the DH transformation matrix, uh, creating individual transformation matrices, so you can transform from the base link to the gripper. You're then given the end effector position here, as well as the roll pitch yaw. 
of the end effector. You will need to extract the wrist center and with the wrist center extract theta 1 through 6. Once you calculate theta 1 through 6 it is populated and you move on to the next pose. Now what's happening at a higher level here is that you're generating a path or a trajectory from the robot arm to the cylinder and then once the robot arm extracts the cylinder from the cylinder to the bucket. These paths are in Cartesian coordinates and they're bundled in these pose messages. And so what you are accomplishing is for each pose message you're finding its correlated theta angles to make the robotic arm move its end effector to that position. Now, before we walk through the code and the way to approach different parts here, let's take a look at the default debugger that comes in the repo now. It's called ikdebug. This allows you to test your code and evaluate it without running all the additional ROS components. Uh, it is less of a process to check for errors and make sure everything's running smooth. And so there are some test cases that come with it. The format of a test case is here, as well as how to generate your own. There's some initial code here that helps you just control paste the code you have in your IK server or the code you write here, and you can move them back and forth without any modifications. So the code you'd have in your IK server you could paste here, and it will operate the same. Some other things you can add is your forward kinematics in order to verify your end effector error because there will be times in which you calculate thetas that appear wrong but your end effector is in the right position. This is due to having multiple solutions for the theta values. For the wrist center and the end effector you calculate, you will need to populate with your values here for error analysis and then there is some printouts that help quantify any errors. Now let's go ahead and step through the code. So we begin this code by defining the DH parameters. These are your link offsets, your link lengths, and twist angles, as well as the symbolic join angles. Now, information on deriving these DH parameters can be found in the KR210 forward kinematics section in the classroom. Once we find our DH table, we then define our transformation matrix. I chose to make it a function so it would be easier to generate them. It takes various inputs to produce the transformation matrix you want. Then I create the individual transformation matrices. This is the transformation from the base to the first length, the first to the second, all the way to the end effector. We can see that we call all the respective inputs for each transformation matrix, and then we also sub in the DH table. We then create our transformation matrix from the base link to the end effector by multiplying them. Again, we're given the end effector position and its roll pitch yaw. We start by getting the end effector rotation matrix and we do this by multiplying the roll pitch yaw in its respective way to get this. There's information in the classroom on this. I found another helpful link to be right here and I can go ahead and link that in the video as well. There is a rotation error correction that is touched on in the KR210 forwards kinematics section and this is to align our DH parameters with that of the URDF file. Once we have our rotation matrix for the end effector and it's the error has been compensated for, we can then go ahead and create a matrix of the end effector position. We can calculate the wrist center using the supported visual equation this one, where we can see that using the end effector rotation matrix plus the offset subtracted from the end effector position gives us our wrist center position. For calculating joint angles using the geometric inverse kinematics method, there is more information that can be found in the inverse kinematics uh, with KUKA KR210 section, uh, including supporting visuals, so I'll be brief in this. Um, we can extract theta 1 by using the wrist center and this can be done if you look at a top-down view of the arm we're calculating the offset or the angle of the wrist center and we can do that using the arctan2 function. Theta 2 and 3 are a little trickier 
and the supporting visuals help a lot with this. We calculate the side A, B, and C of the triangle, as well as the corresponding angle A, B, and C, and we use these to derive theta 2 and 3. Once we have theta 1, 2, and 3, we then can fill in the rotation matrix from base link to the third link. This can be done by extracting the rotation matrix from a, the respective transformation matrix and multiplying them together, then subbing in theta 1, 2, and 3. This then gives us the rotation matrix from 0 to 3. Now that we have the rotation matrix from 0 and 3, we can take the rotation matrix of the end effector and multiply it by the inverse of 0 and 3 to get the rotation matrix from 3 to 6. Our last step is to calculate theta 4, 5, and 6. More information can be found in the Euler angles from a rotation matrix section to calculate these. Once we have theta 4, 5, and 6, we're good to go. Before we run this error analysis script, I have decided to add in my forward kinematics, and this takes in our complete transformation matrix from the base link to the end effector and subs in our found thetas. Now let's go ahead and run this and see what we get. We'll open up a terminal, change into documents, and we will run this. We can see that it took about a second, which is a long time, to calculate one set of join angles. We get our wrist air for the x, y, and z position, and then the overall wrist offset. We then get our theta 1 through 6 errors. We get a note about the theta errors that they may not be correct because there are multiple solutions. And the best way to check is to add your forward kinematics. And this is going to compare your calculated end effector position versus the supplied end effector position, as well as the overall offset. Now, you can go in and change the test case by changing the test case number down here and evaluate different scenarios. The last thing I want to talk about is optimization techniques. If we look in our code, we are only evaluating a single example here. Now, when we look at the code for this project, can see that we are iterating right here through all of the poses in our trajectory which could be a few or a lot but times important here one way you could get around this is by building your forward kinematics in this section so you have them built and then you only evaluate them for each pose you could even optimize further by creating a class structure and when you initialize down here, particularly in the definition of IK server, you could initialize your class structure that does all of the kinematics for you, and you could call upon them. Other ideas people usually try are saving their transformation matrices and the rotation matrices to pickle files and loading them. Um, they also try doing everything in NumPy uh, to get appreciable gains. What I recommend is try out a few different things, but when you're using this debug script, take into account um, the time it's taking to calculate one set. The lower you can get the runtime to calculate one set of join angles, the faster your project's going to be able to compute all of the possible permutations or all of the possible poses uh, in a fast manner. Last thing I want to talk about is running the project. If you go to launch, you go to inverse kinematics launch, you'll see this param name demo value true type boolean. So when you first start the project and you launch it via the safe spawner script, you'll be able to cycle through and get an idea of the calculations that are happening and how it's supposed to look. When you're ready to run your code, however, you're going to want to switch this value to false run the project as normal, but then you're going to have to run your IK server separately. Once you do that, you're on your way to solving the Udacity Pick and Place project. I hope this was of help to you guys. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask them in Slack.